Did you know there are more people with genius IQs living in China than there are people of any kind living in the United States? That can't possibly be true. It is. What would account for that? Well, first, an awful lot of people live in China, but here's the question. How necessary is dialogue? One of my favorite introductions from the past few years came from this simple opening scene from The Social Network. And on a purely theoretical basis, it may seem to be anti-cinema to have two people talking as your introduction to a cinematic world. But not if it's done right. Dialogue is arguably the most apparent aspect of film. It's the area that, when it's happening, almost all of the audience's attention hones in on it. So it's pretty important that you get it right. I feel The Social Network is a perfect example of good cinematic dialogue. But why does this scene in particular resonate with so many people? Before we analyse this, we need to know the purpose of dialogue. If you were to dilute dialogue down to its one necessary singular purpose, it would be to further the plot, explain where our characters have been and where they're planning to get to. Now, uh, what seems to be the problem? My husband. I believe is seeing another woman. No, really? This is dialogue of the expository variety. An expository dialogue is, in my opinion, a necessary evil. If it were possible, we'd eschew it completely, but more often than not, it just has to be done. In order for a story to be cohesive, there are certain things that need to be established. Character histories, the current state of affairs, all things that at some point will be relevant to the plot progression. And sometimes these things are most effectively expressed through expository dialogue. Listen, David, I've been meaning to talk with you. It's nice that you see me so much now. But don't, don't start with that. I'm only saying it's been what, four years? You're still wearing a wedding band? Three years. I right, three, four, you're divorced. Come on, move on. This is not healthy. No, this is not healthy. That's how not to do it. The biggest issue with these scenes is that it can be really difficult to write something that makes the audience believe the character they see would in fact say that. The core problem is that when two people in real life have any sort of relationship, they don't explain things to one another that they both already know. I haven't felt you this tense since, since we fell into that nest of gun dogs. <laughs> you fell into that nightmare, Master, and I rescued you, remember? Oh, yes. It requires more subtlety, a sufficient reason for your character to say what needs to be said for the sake of the audience. So instead of reinforcing what your characters already know, it's more effective to deliver expository dialogue on an outsider unfamiliar with the world. Well, who is he? What's his name? His name is Luca Brasi. He helps my father out sometimes. Moments like this not only allow the audience to gain a glimpse of the kind of world they're about to enter, but more importantly, they're realistic. That's my family, Katie. It's not me. Essentially, they're establishing devices for the audience, but as long as I, as a viewer, can believe that this information will be spoken at this time, I learn more about the world and don't have to suspend my disbelief. And he was a good friend. But this in itself can lead to further trouble. A sign of imbalanced writing is a script saturated with expository dialogue. Then your characters aren't talking, they're explaining. And what it mainly leads to is a lot of this. What's happened to me? How do you know all this? What is happening to me? The Matrix. Too many question marks on the page is a good indicator that something has gone wrong. Of course, some concepts require more exposition for the audience than others. They don't actually come into the dream. They just, they just design the levels and teach them to the dreamers, that's all. But just so the audience doesn't feel as though it's being spoon-fed everything, balance the dialogue with moments where the character requires information to be given to them. Remember, you are the dreamer. You build this world. I am the subject. My mind populates it. To moments where they discover things themselves. And the truth that as we go deeper into Fisher, we're also going deeper into you. And I'm not sure we're going to like what we find. But of course, all of this is based around the notion that dialogue is for the sole purposes of moving the plot along, which it isn't. In fact, dialogue has one purpose that, in my view, is its most important artistic responsibility, to reveal character. What is a hard cunt doing? Or a so-called hard cunt? Shades it! Pushed on his drink, turns, and gets that fuck out of it. 
And after that, one again was me. Something you should always remember is that action is character. How a character conducts oneself in the face of adversity shows us their attributes more than anything else. Action is character, and therefore dialogue is a byproduct of character. If your character is well fleshed out, everything they say should be ways to reveal their personality to the audience. What? The cards, the last thing I told you was to mind the cards. Well, I've not bought them. But what we have to remember is that dialogue is different to conversation. Humans in the wild, when we speak, we talk and talk and talk and never get to the point. And that's a problem is, in real life, real dialogue seems to never go anywhere. So what we don't want is real dialogue, we want something that appears to be real dialogue. In Tarantino's earlier work, you can see just how nuanced the dialogue is, making it appear real in order to reveal character. Want some bacon? No, man, I don't eat pork. Are you Jewish? No, I ain't Jewish, I just don't dig on swine, that's all. Why not? Pigs are filthy animals. I don't eat filthy animals. At first glance, all these quirky moments may appear to be just little entertaining segments of the film, but they serve dialogue's greatest purpose. They reveal information about who these people are, as well as who they will become. Another fantastic opening dialogue scene comes from Reservoir Dogs, which works in exactly the same way. We got Madonna's big dick coming out of my left ear, and Toby the Jet, I don't know what, coming out of my right. Maybe this just seems like an interesting setup to establish the tone, but each character's dialogue foreshadows the path they will end up taking. Spoilers ahead. Mr. Pink spends the entire discussion putting forth his argument against tipping. But no, society says, don't tip these guys over here, but tip these guys over here. That's bullshit. He's the kind of guy that will try and convince everyone else that he's right if he holds a firm view. Staying true to himself, he spends the rest of the film trying to convince everyone that his theory of a rat in the crew is correct. Right? I'm not saying they weren't there. I'm saying they were there. But they didn't make it, they didn't move movement to let the, the Mr. Blonde started shooting everybody. I mean, that's how I know we were set up. Similarly, Mr. Orange is the first to snitch on Mr. Pink in the cafe. Wait a minute. Who didn't throw in? Mr. Pink. Mr. Pink. Why not? You don't tip. He's someone that obeys authority and does in fact turn out to be the snitch in the crew. Listen to me more than this, I'm a cop. The actions these characters take throughout the film establish the persona that was reinforced in the opening scene through nothing but dialogue. Tarantino's style is something that's been widely imitated but not always utilised correctly. Dialogue isn't people having conversations, it's characters having a dialogue. We're watching a finite set of attributes express those attributes through opinions on a particular topic. The biggest mistake when trying to replicate this method is that dialogue can come across as too natural. It just becomes a conversation that completes neither function of furthering the plot or revealing character. Robert McKee calls this kind of dialogue talking wallpaper. I thought I would take her up on it. <laughs> I never ate so much. Yeah, the barbecue chicken was delicious rice. That was cool. The kind of back and forth you hear in real life doesn't belong in a film, but talented actors can make the most banal dialogue shine through the talent of improvisation, injecting the characters' nuances into their inflections and behaviours of the conversation. Yeah, but get yourself a girl so you could settle down. That's what I, I mean. settle down almost every night, but then in the morning I'm free. I love you. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. Why? I just settle down. <laughs> Ultimately, dialogue can only be as good as its character which is why it's so important to emphasise character through dialogue. But if this fictional person has been well thought out, then almost anything they say can work. Get into their mindset and understand all the inner traits of that character and ask, what would they say? Clear motivations that shine through dialogue is what we want to hear. Whether it's Tarantino layering character mannerisms throughout a scene or something more realist, show us character and you've got good dialogue. You fucking there, mate. So get in that car and fuck off. But how does the dialogue process actually work? Often character relationships are complex and will go much beyond the surface level. This means the way characters talk to one another will be very intricate. Take this scene from Annie Hall, showing what a character says compared to what a character thinks. 
Photography is interesting because you know it's a it's a new art form and a, a, a set of aesthetic criteria have not emerged yet. Aesthetic criteria? You mean whether it's a good photo or not? This is a perfect example of a very important technique when writing dialogue, subtext. When writing dialogue between two characters, you should know the intentions of that character for every line they speak, because there's always a distinction of what a character says and what a character means. Dialogue becomes very stale when it states exactly what a character thinks. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. If we look at a later scene in Annie Hall, we see this trend continue. Both characters discuss removing a spider from the apartment. I can't sleep with the live thing crawling around in the bed. Kill it! For God, what's wrong with you? Don't you have a can of raid in the house? No. When in reality, they use this situation to discuss one another's traits. Alfie uses sarcasm and passive aggression to hint that he's not happy with Annie moving on so quickly in life. When Doc had a wonderful idea, why don't you get the guy that took you to the rock concert, we'll call him, and he can come over and kill the spider. And Annie wants to tell Alfie that she still cares about him, and feels she made a mistake. Alfie, you're a little hostile, you know that? Not only that, you look thin and tired. There's so much that they want to say to each other, but the situation dictates that they can only say it through insinuation and suggestion. This is the kind of approach that should be taken to dialogue. It allows the audience to understand characters more by deciphering what they're trying to say. For instance, in There Will Be Blood, it says a lot more about the character of Daniel Plainview, that instead of being frank with Eli, he's condescending to him. I drink your milkshake. But never forget that dialogue isn't one person talking. It's in the name. Characters that agree with one another or a one-way conversation goes nowhere. You sly dog! You got me monologuing! I can't believe it! The final ingredient of dialogue is that it should be thought of as reactionary. Remember, action is character. So what behaviours do our characters employ upon hearing something that they too share an opinion on? Yep. Well, uh, do you want to know my actual response to all this? I mean, do you want to hear my actual response? Yes. Think of every dialogue as a test of your character's ideals, because herein lies possibly the key component of dialogue and the key component of any drama. Conflict. Conflict gives characters a reason to respond to one another. Will you shut the fuck up and listen to me? Just listen to me! Gives them a reason to reveal the other person's flaws and character traits. You, you are dying. Uh, uh, do you know that you say that to me every day of your life? Oh. I'm dying. Well, you're not dying, you're killing the people around you is what you're doing. And reveals information to the audience whilst keeping us invested in the action. Dialogue needs to develop around common ideas. It needs to be controlled, but it shouldn't be forced either. It should be an interplay, it should be a bit of a dance. The best dialogue comes out of drama and simultaneously creates drama. Action, reaction. So treat dialogue as you would any other aspect of film. Have it slowly crescendo and punctuate it with a climax that changes everything. What was Sean Parker's ownership share diluted down to? It wasn't. What was Peter Thiel's ownership share diluted down to? It wasn't. And what was your ownership share diluted down to? 0.03%. Seeing what can be done to separate functional dialogue from great dialogue, Rewatching these opening five minutes is almost like seeing the blueprints of how to teach the audience about a character through what they say. We open talking about geniuses around the world. China. Here's the question. How do you distinguish yourself in the population of people who all got 1600 under SATs? I didn't know they take SATs in China. They don't. I wasn't talking about China anymore. I was talking about me. This moment is the film's way of telling us Mark's most important attribute. He's a genius but he's also socially awkward. Good thing. This is serious. On the other hand, I do like guys who wrote crime. Well, I can't do that. As it carries on, the topic of conversation reveals our character's goals, as well as even more attributes. I'm trying right now. To row crew? To get into a final club. To row crew? No, are you like, whatever, delusional? Getting into a final club does later become a vital part of Mark's plot progression, as well as his obsession with success. Returning to the ingredients of making a good dialogue scene, both characters show intentions beyond what they actually say. This can be analysed through the dialogue alone, 
But to understand it more, just look at how much detail Fincher goes into with his actors in order for them to understand why their character is saying what they're saying. Bruni, you can really wind up on, yes, there is. That can be extremely pointed so that it really makes him go, I have to stop and note that for a second. That was, seems like another kind of communication, more than just words, which is really where I'm sort of more comfortable in. It's a combination of great acting and precise direction, and it can inject the simplest line with a staggering amount of depth. Okay, well, which is the easiest to get into? Why would you ask me that? I was just asking. And here, the conversation begins to add a conflict, where both characters are reacting to one another. Well, why don't you just concentrate on being the best you you can be? Did you really just say that? I was kidding. As well as misunderstanding their intentions. I'm going back to wait, my Wait, wait, is this real? Yes. Okay, then wait, I apologize, okay? We spend the entire opening subconsciously learning about our characters until it transforms into a dramatic scene that builds and builds until its last punch. You're gonna go through life thinking that girls don't like you because you're a nerd. And I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that that won't be true. It'll be because you're an asshole. Meet our main character. Everything we've heard in this scene has laid the foundations for a character that we'll see unfold over the course of the story. You're not an asshole, Mark. You're just trying so hard to be. We all know great dialogue when we hear it. Those moments that upon a first hearing sound as though they'll be forever carved in time. Dialogue should be an easy thing to do. We constantly hear and do it. Yet in order to make it work cinematically, it requires a discipline. Rules that screenwriters like Aaron Sorkin can easily implement into scenes like this one. All it takes is five minutes, and we've been told the goals of these characters their relationships, but most importantly, the kind of people they are. This is all we want from dialogue, to fill in the blanks that the rest of the cinematic language can't fill in. Some people say that silent cinema is the purest form of cinema. I disagree. To me, there is no pure cinema, but there is good cinema, and the best has neither a little nor a lot of dialogue. It has just the right amount. So I suppose if there is one more rule about good dialogue, it'd be know when to speak and when to stop.